which is taken from the first epistle of uh, Peter. If you are not with us by physical presence, but you're joining us by way of delayed television, welcome to Bethel. This is the Bethel Baptist Church. We are worshiping at the uh, address that is 3200 28th Avenue North. Uh, we are here every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock for worship. We're here at 8.30 for Sunday school. We're here on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock for our midweek Bible study. We invite you to come if you have an opportunity. If God gives you the opportunity and the Holy Spirit gives you the unction, please come and join us. We'd be so happy to have you. That's the Bethel Baptist Church, 3200, 28th Avenue North. The phone number is 205-322-5360. Today we're going to be studying from the book of 1 Peter. And we want to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to read again for you the responsive reading, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole responsive reading. I'm going to go to the crux of the matter. Uh, and that is chapter 2. Let's look at chapter 2. And I want to read verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Are we there? Amen. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to talk to you this morning uh, about your appetite. Particularly, I want to talk to you about your spiritual appetite. More specifically than that, I want to talk to you about your appetite for the Word of God. If you've ever gone to a doctor, one of the things, uh, one of the many questions he's probably going to ask you is, how is your appetite? And he's asking you that not because he wants to take you, he or she wants to take you out to lunch, but because they understand a very simple principle, and that is that your appetite determines in some ways how healthy you are. Uh, if you have a good appetite, if your body is functioning normally, it is going to produce in your hunger. And I submit to you that the same thing is true spiritually, that if you are functioning normally, your spirit is going to produce in you a hunger. There's going to be a hunger for spiritual things. There's going to be a hunger for the things of God. There's going to be a hunger to know Him better. There's going to be a hunger to grow. There's going to be a hunger to do deeper things and to experience deeper things with God. And I submit to you, much as a doctor would, that if you are not having this strong appetite, that maybe we need to do something different about your diet or about the way you live. And the truth of the matter is, all of us are hungry for something. The other truth of the matter is that we are driven by what we are hungry for. Those that are hungry for love will do anything to feel love. Even if it means being abused by somebody. They, they, they do it because in some way for that few minutes, they feel that somebody loves them. There are those that are hungry for intimacy, and by intimacy I do not mean sex. If I meant sex, I would have said sex. I'm not saying sex, I'm saying intimacy. Intimacy is that ability to be close to somebody. To be able to let your guard down and to share with them who you are and to let them see who you are and to know who they are. And we all have that need. We want to be close to somebody. Some people have the need so strongly that they find a pet and they talk to their pet because they feel like their pet is the only one that is going to understand them and going to listen to them and not going to judge them, but they can be close to their pet. And some people get so strong that they even leave their money to their pet because they feel like their pet was the only one that loved us. All all of us have a need. All of us have a hunger for something. For some of us, it is a hunger for power. Amen. And we want to feel powerful. Amen. And sometimes we get to the point of being controllers because we want to feel powerful. And we know from psychology that sometimes people who have been abused in life or who have been taken advantage of end up being controllers because somebody took advantage of them once because they were out of control or not in control. So they figure I need to control every other aspect of life so that nobody will ever take advantage of me ever again. It is not that they want to be in control. They, they just want to not to feel powerless. And they're driven by it. And all of us know probably people who are driven by money 
of what money can buy. And they work and they work and they work and they save and they save and they save. And some people even cheat and cheat and cheat because they want the feeling. They're hungry for that feeling of what money can buy. Amen. Amen. All of us are driven in some way and somehow by hunger. And that's not necessarily wrong as long as that hunger is being met God's way. Now again, I want to share with you and I want to challenge you this morning to have a hunger for God's word. Whatever it is, whatever it is in life that you're hungry for is what's driving you. Whatever it is, whatever it is in life that you're hungry for is what's driving you. Now, what I want to also encourage us to examine is the spiritual appetite, our spiritual appetite for the things of God. It is vitally important that not only every individual, but that every church has a hunger for God. God promises to feed the hungry. And if you don't hunger, and if you don't thirst, it's difficult for God to feed you. Much like a nursing baby. If the baby is not hungry, though the mother is engorged and has all of this milk that she wants to feed the baby, even to the point where she is hurting because she wants to, to get all of this milk out of her, yet if the baby is not hungry, there's nothing that she can do. And so... It is, I believe, with the things of God. God looks for people that are hungry. God wants some people that are hungry. One of the greatest men, evangelists, and leaders of uh, these past centuries was a man named John G. Lake. And, and as you study John G. Lake, John G. Lake was very hungry for the things of God. John G. Lake, according to things written about him, spent nine months praying, praying for God to send the miraculous, that God would do miracles through his life, that God would do greater and greater miracles, and God did begin to do greater and greater miracles in his life, but only because he was hungry for it. And those who are hungry for it, God promises to feed, as he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, because they shall be filled. And it is our, our depth of hunger that determines our depth of seeking God. I want to do what I normally do, and that is I want to take something physical and I want to try to uh, apply it to the spiritual in hopes to help you understand the spiritual. The desire is not to try to bring the spiritual down to the carnal level, but I have found, much as Jesus did, that if you take something natural, that people understand, and you apply spiritual principles is a lot easier to understand. That's why he told parables. That's why he told parables about sowing to farmers. They understood if you don't put any seed in the ground, you don't get anything come back. He understood that if you put seed in the ground, and if you don't water it, or if the weeds grow up, then nothing will come up. And so as we look at hunger, I want to begin by looking at just the opposite, some of the things that cause us not to be hungry. Some of the things that causes us to lose our spiritual appetite or natural appetite. Most of this comes from a website called the Heartline. So if you want, Healthline, excuse me. So that if you want to go back and you want to check up on me to see if I've done my research, you're welcome to do that. It's called healthline.com. And these are the four major reasons why people have a decreased appetite. Again, I want to use those natural things to broaden them to spiritual things, and then I want to come back to 1 Peter and tell you why it is important to have a good spiritual appetite for the Word. Now, first of all, this particular website says that sometimes people lose their appetites because of a bacteria or a virus, something like colds, flu, uh, influenza, uh, coughing, tiredness, things like that. That, that cause you to get to a point where you don't feel like eating. 
Now, if you take that particular natural thing and compare it to spiritual thing, that can be likened to sometimes we lose our spiritual appetite because there's sin in our lives that need to be dealt with. Amen. 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 It is not necessarily a full-fledged sickness, but there is something in your life that keeps you from desiring the Word of God. James and Peter talks about there are certain things of the Spirit. Peter says, or James says rather, laying aside all superfluity of naughtiness, in other words, all excess of sinfulness. If you lay that aside, then you can receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. So many times in our lives, if there's sin in our lives, it pushes us away from God. And sin will push you away from God. Sin will drive a wedge between you and God, not because God has moved, but because you're not seeking him. Because you're not desiring him. Because you don't want him. When you get so full of the world and get so full of yourself and get so full of sin in your life, it will get you to the point where your spiritual appetite is dampened. And when your spiritual appetite is dampened, sometimes that can lead to being malnourished if it stays there long enough. So if there is in your life a decreased appetite for the word, Check to see if there's any sin. Sin in your life will make you hungry, but not for the word. Sin. Point number two. This website says that some people lose their appetite because of psychological causes. In other words, they get sad, they get depressed. Now, it works opposite in some people. When they get sad or depressed, they eat more. Okay. But there are some when they get sad, they don't eat. They just don't eat. When they get worried, they just don't eat. When they get depressed, they just don't eat. When they get grieved, they just don't eat. My wife just lost the first cousin uh, a couple of weeks ago. And what happened to this first cousin is that she just stopped eating. She just stopped eating. She wasn't a very old person, but she just decided that she didn't stop eating. We found out, or we knew actually, she had just lost a brother-in-law uh, and a sister within a month's time. And she was so heartbroken, she was so grieved, that she herself just stopped eating. She wouldn't eat. And if you don't eat, your body begins to shut down and different things begin to get out of kilter and chemicals that should be there to, to create a natural balance are not there, they create an imbalance and sooner or later if you have particularly other complicating medical conditions your body just begins to shut down. And the point of it is that sometimes circumstances can come in your life, situations, Trials can come in your life that will get you to the point where you feel like there's no need in even reading the Bible because it's not helping, it's not making sense. There's some people that have left God because of grief over something. Maybe it is a sin, it was a sin in your life and you got to the point where you felt like God would not forgive you or God would not hear you so there's no use in reading the Bible and Satan loves to try to get you in that kind of a situation. He loves to tell you there is no use in serving God. If you read the Psalms, sometimes the Psalms will go through and they talk about the fact that the enemies of God would say to him, why are you serving God? There's no use in serving God. Job's wife got to the point of saying to, 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 to him, why don't you just curse God and die? Because reading the Bible and doing what God would have you to do is not making a difference. And I remember even as a young believer, as, as I was growing up in Christ, just not seeing any difference in my life. You know, you read, you read, you read, you pray, you pray, you pray, and it seems like nothing is happening. Anybody ever felt like that? Amen. 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 If all of us have felt like that, if all of us have felt like that, then it's very common for all of us at some point in our lives to get depressed. Amen. 
and the time in your life when you get depressed and feel like you should not read is a time you absolutely should read. Because if Satan can drive you away from the word of God, then he can keep you in whatever condition it is that he has you. Amen. Point number three, some people lose their appetite because of boredom or stress. I want to liken this to uh, the fact that sometimes we get to feeling that there is no hope in God. We have been going through the same thing over and over again, and we get to the point of our lives of saying, what is the use? I've been in church all my life, and I've read this stuff all my life, and it doesn't seem like it's doing any good. What is the use? Sometimes people can't see the spiritual growth in their lives. And, so, and people, that's why there are times in our lives that God allows trials. Why does God allow trials sometimes? It is because you need to know that what he is doing in you is taking effect. If he never allows a trial, you'll think that you're at the same level that you've always been. But when you go through a trial and you see yourself handle it differently than you had before, then you understand that some growth has taken place. But if there was never a trial, if there was never something where you had to use your faith, then you would not understand what God has been doing in your life. And so sometimes God allows the trial so that you will understand that true growth has taken place. Fourth thing, and then I want to get to why it's important that we develop a good appetite for the word. Fourth thing it says is sometimes people don't eat well because of drugs. Many of you have seen this. Use of illicit drugs can reduce your appetite. There are people when they're on drugs, the drugs gives them a false sensation and they just don't eat. They become very, very thin and they just don't eat because the drugs has arrested the normal uh, cycle of hunger being fed and hunger and being fed and hunger and being fed. And if there's some kind of spirit that you're dealing with, some kind of supernatural thing that has come in and taken uh, oppression in your life, not possession, oppression, where it's more than just a temporary thing, where you are grieving more than for a month or so, but you're grieving for years. That is unnatural. And Satan can come in and set up a camp in your life. And that, because, that becomes very, very harmful to you. And so drug use, any other kind of illicit self-destructive behavior will rob your appetite. Now, let's go back to the word. First Peter chapter 1. I want to look at verse 23. And these are four reasons why the Bible tells us that the Word of God is important and why all of us should have a very, very healthy appetite for the Word. And let me say while I'm saying this, that one of the reasons why we have Bible study, why we have Sunday school, why we have actually two Bible studies, is so that you can be fed the Word of God. It is not good songs that is going to sustain you in your time of temptation. Now, the Bible does does say that when I'm in trouble, you can pass me about with songs of deliverance. I understand it. The book of Psalms says that. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to fighting the enemy, Jesus did not sing songs. He didn't break out with a charge to keep our have a God to glorify. Never once do we read when you said, when I can read my title clear to mansions in the skies, I'll bid farewell to every fear and wipe my weeping eyes. He said, it is written. It is written. And one of the things that I am really concerned about, particularly from a global church, is that we've gotten so, so used to believing that God is a genie that we can rub and say, bless me with a Cadillac, or bless me with a new house, or bless me with a new job, or bless me with this and bless me with that, that we, we, we fail to understand that the word of God was given not just so we can be actualized or self-actualized, 
is self-actualized. The word of God is given so that we can be what God has called us to be. And there's more than just having things. Nothing wrong with things. But things are not the substance of our lives. If your life is built and based on what you have, your life is built on a shallow foundation. You should always be more than what you have. You should always be more than what you have. Your life should be more than what you have, such that if all of it goes, there's enough in you to do it again. If all of your money goes, there's enough word in you, there's enough character in you, there's enough patience in you so that God can take you where you are and do it all over again because who you are is greater than what you have. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23. This is why we should have a hunger for the word of God. Number one, it says this, that we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Number one, we should have a hunger for the word of God, because it was the word of God by which God got us born again. Amen. It is the seed, literal word that's used in the book of James, it is the sperma, the sperm, that God used to get us born again. James chapter 1, verses 18 and through 21. He says, he begot us with the word of truth. We're not going to look there, but he begot us with the word of truth. And then it says, wherefore, laying aside all filthiness of the flesh and superfluity of naughtiness, that we ought to receive the engrafted word. That's the word that the Holy Spirit made alive. Literal word from the Greek uh, means to be implanted. The word of God that was implanted in your spirit, that the Holy Spirit made alive so that you could be born again. So all of us should hunger for the word and all of us should share the word and all of us should preach the word because it is the preaching of the word that gives men the, the, the wherewithal to be born again. It is by grace through faith, God has to give us both the grace and the faith. All of it is a gift of God. That's number one. Number two, we won't have to spend much time on that because we all know that. Number two, we need to honor the word. We need to hunger for the word because the word is alive. Literal word, it is full of life. It is full of life. Turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms, chapter 119, or division 119, number 119, actually, and verse number 30, Psalm number 119. And I want to look at verse 30, Psalm 119, verse 30. We're going to spend a little time using our Bibles today so that you won't just bring it here and carry it as you would an umbrella, but you actually use it. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 30. The word is alive. That's what we're talking about. The word is alive. It is full of life. Psalm 119, verse 30. And it reads thusly. Are we there? All right. I'm sorry. It should have been 130, not 30. Yes. Psalm 119, 130. Are we there now? The entrance of thy word giveth light. It gives understanding unto the simple. The entrance of your word is so alive and so full of life that when I take it into me, it gives me life. Now, if you want to have life in your spirit continually and continuously, it is important that we have a daily infusion of God's Word. 
It is important every day that we have God's word alive in our hearts so that it makes us more and more alive. Just like your body reproduces cells every so often and your blood is cleansed every so often so that you can stay alive. So the word of God is important for us so that we stay active, so that we stay alive spiritually, so that we get to the point where we are not only alive as in existing, but we are alive as in quick and understanding and knowing what God would have for us to know and do what God would have for us to do. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 reminds us that the word of God is quick and it is alive. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And that same word is a discerner of the thoughts, uh, a discerner of the hearts and intents of, in, in, the, in the thoughts. I didn't quote that exactly right at the end. But the word is quick. Let's turn to James chapter 1. If you were in, um, if you were in, First Peter, you should be very close to James. Peter, James, and John, remember this, always hang out, hang out together. They hung out together when Jesus was alive. They hang out together now in Scripture. So if you find Peter, James, and John, they're all right there together. Find one of them, you can find the other. James chapter 1. I want to look at verse number 22. I want to begin at verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. We're talking about why it is important that we have a healthy appetite for the Word. And point number two is because the Word of God is life. It is life to our spirits. It is fresh. It helps us to understand who we are, where we are, and not only who we are and where we are today, but where God wants to carry us. That's how alive it is. It's not only alive to make you born again, but it's also alive to identify where you are right now, but also alive enough to take you where you need to be in the future. James chapter 1, what verse did I tell you? Verse 22, very good. But be ye doers of the word, we already talked about verse 21, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholding himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, James is, is very clever in the way he describes the Bible. And he says this, that the Bible is like looking at yourself in a mirror. That when you study the Bible, when you read the Bible, when the Holy Spirit is dealing with you as you're reading the Bible, it's like looking at yourself in a spiritual mirror. That you can look at yourself. And, and, and if you read a verse that deals with the thoughts of your mind, that, that, that the Bible reflects what you have going on on the inside of your mind. The physical mirror can only reflect the external. The spiritual mirror reflects the internal. When you look at the Bible, if the Bible is being preached, it should convict you down to your very core. Because it is the mirror of the Spirit. But he says, if you look at what the Bible says, and you go away and forget what the Bible says, you're no better than a man who looks at himself in the mirror and sees that his tie is crooked and does not make the adjustment and goes away and his tie is crooked for the rest of the day. Amen. The whole purpose of a mirror is to confirm and to make adjustments. The whole purpose of a mirror. Why do you look in a mirror? You look in a mirror and say, I'm still pretty, right? I mean, I mean that's why you look in a mirror, right? I thought I was pretty, but I just wanted to make sure I'm still pretty. Look, yeah, I'm still pretty. Okay, let's go on. Okay, but, but, but that's what you look in a mirror for. 
And the same way, when we look in the Word of God, we should examine our thoughts, we should examine our aspirations, we should examine everything we do by the Word of God. So that if we look in the Word of God, and if God is not convicting us to change direction, to change attitude, to change whatever, then we have confirmation that we're doing what God would have for us to do. But if we look in the Word of God, and it says to change then God is helping us to make some spiritual adjustments so that when we go out and walk before the world, we don't look silly. But if you look in the Word and you forget what the Bible tells you to do, then you walk out and we look silly. Third reason why we should have a hunger for the Word of God is because it's not only alive for now, but as I told you earlier, it will live in the future. The Bible uses the word incorruptible. Unchangeable is what it means. It does not change. The same words that we're reading now, people many generations ago were preaching the same word. It has the same effect. It can change the same kind of circumstance the same kind of situation, the same word that Peter, James, and John used to say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It works now. The same thing Jesus said when he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, and him only shall you serve. It'll work now. The same word when Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. It'll work now. The same word where it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bring the Captivity, every thought to be used of Christ. It'll work now. The same Isaiah 26 3 that says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. It'll work now. And guess what? Tomorrow it'll still be there. It'll still be working. Because his word does not change. Everything else changes. People change. Morals change. Dress changes. Virtually everything changes. But God tells us through the mouth, Peter, and of James, the word of God does not change. The Bible says to us in the book of Hebrews, I believe it is, that God willing to show us the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. In other words, he wrote down what he wanted to tell us so that all of us from beginning of time to the end of time would know that God meant exactly what he said. He is not going to change it. He's not going to give somebody a new revelation that contradicts a revelation he gave before. It does not change. The psalmist said, Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. And so if we want something that does not change, it has to be the Word of God. Point number four, God wants us to have a healthy appetite for the Word based on 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, because it is a means by which growth is produced. If we're going to grow in spiritual things, it has to be in direct proportion to the amount of Word that we allow to take root in our lives. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, you know the verse very well. It says, so then faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. And hearing by the word of God. That if no one had ever preached to you that you could be saved, you would not have had faith. God never would have imparted to you faith and grace so that you could respond to that. If God never would have preached to you that you can have peace in your mind in the midst of circumstances, you would never have had faith for that, and God never could have imparted grace to you. Well, it is important to you that in every aspect of God's Word that you have someone putting that into your spirit. Because you'll never grow beyond the amount of Word that is in your life. If you don't believe God can heal today, you'll never grow beyond that point because you don't have faith for that. Growth is a product of the Word of God growing up in your life. 
And if that is not in your life, then it's difficult. Remember 1 Peter, 2 Peter rather, chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. We've talked about this before. Divine nature is another way of saying what is natural, the natural course of life, for those that walk in the Spirit. And there is a natural course of life that is far different for those who walk in the Spirit than those who walk in the flesh. But that's based on the promises of God. It is based on what God says. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 talks to us again about the fact that the word preached unto them did not profit them because they never mixed faith with it. Paul tells Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, the book of 2 Timothy. He says, Timothy, from a child you've been able to, you've known the Holy Scriptures which are, make, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. And then he goes into verse 16, which we all know all faith, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is the end result, that the man and woman of God may be fully mature, fully able, and furnished, so that whatever good work God calls you to, you are mature enough to deal with it. So that if God calls you to come and witness or be a minister to a person who has been involved in prostitution, that you have the wherewithal because the word of God is in you to deal with that circumstance and to lead them from where they are to where they need to be. But if the word of God is not dwelling in us richly, then it makes us inept. It makes us anemic. It makes us unprofitable. Final two scriptures, then I close. John chapter 17, verse 17. Jesus is praying what we commonly call the high priestly prayer. And in the high priestly prayer, he says, Lord, I want you to set them apart or sanctify them through your word. Because if they will take, I'm amplifying here, if they will take your word and let it live in them, it will set them apart from everybody in this world. They will live a better life. Better is not necessarily richer, but it could involve richer. They will live a better life. They will deal with circumstances better. They have a better peace of mind. They will know how in trouble and in adversity to pray and get answers. They'll have the wisdom that they need all because they spend time in your word and you have set them apart because your word is living in them and your word is dwelling in them. Ephesians 5, 26. The Bible talks about a husband loving his wife and he uses a parallel. He says, I want you to love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then he has his part. And Christ gave himself for the church that he might sanctify and cleanse it. How is he going to do that? By the continual washing of the water by the word. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, makes a quote that I want to close with today. He says, if I find myself, if I find in myself a desire that no experience in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, it does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it. 
but only to arouse it and suggest the real thing. And the point he makes is that sometimes in this world, there are desires, there are hunger that occur. And he says that, that, that they occur not because God wants you to look around you and find something in this natural world that will satisfy that hunger, but sometimes that hunger is aroused so that you might look to something greater than what's around you. I submit to you that part of the job of the Word of God is to create in you a hunger and a thirst so that you no longer look for answers with everything around you, but that you look heavenly. Amen. Because the things of God can only be satisfied by the Spirit and the things of God. The Word of God, though, is the bridge. It is the doorway. It is a pathway that helps us to see clearly what God would have for us to have. A hunger for the Word is important because the Word is what gave us the new birth. The Word is what God uses in our lives to keep us alive. To keep us alive, to keep us on the cutting edge. It is something that God will use to even direct us in the future. And the Word of God is a thing that God uses to sanctify, to cleanse us, to cause growth and development in our lives. Let's pray.